Well, thank you very much, Michael, and um, my thanks also to the Foreign Policy Association. I think this um, program on um, great decisions is always one that has um, particular salience every year, and it's a, a real pleasure to be following the speakers you've had uh, previously, um, uh, Dr. Devlin and Dr. Evans and Dr. Ellis, and I, I feel uh, also that um, just in just shortly before I came over here, I read um, that the International Criminal Court has issued a uh, arrest warrant for Vladimir Putin. So as a sort of uh, pre-advertisement for next week, um, um, uh, 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 Dr. Hamilton will be speaking on war crimes. And I think uh, they've uh, you know, that sort of tees things up very nicely. So some good foresight there from the Foreign Policy Association. Um, I, I should also say, um, as, I mean, you've been to many of these before and have had many speakers from the Air War, or sorry, the Army War College, and um, you know that our, uh, we give you the disclaimer at the beginning that the things that I say here today aren't the opinion, they're my opinions, they're not those of the U.S. Army, the U.S. Army War College or the Department of Defense. So with those preliminaries out of the way, I'd like to uh, kick off my talk here on uh, economic warfare, primarily about economic sanctions as well, and I'll, I'll look um, um, uh, uh, how that fits into a sort of broader uh, perspective. Now what I'm going to look at is um, initially um, sort of issues of what we call coercion theory, and um, one of our um, uh, you know, local scholars um, who's probably familiar to many of you, uh, Dr. Uh, Tammy Biddle is, has written extensively on this and some of the material I, uh, uh, I'm providing here is drawn from her work. But within the issues of coercion, of which military coercion and physical force are a component, there's also economic coercion, how you get someone else to do things they might not otherwise be willing to do. So within that, how you exert economic power to influence others will be what I'll talk about in particular. And that has a long history for American policymakers. We often think, certainly in the last several decades, the extent to which the United States has relied upon its way. But historically, the United States had been much more um, frequent in the use of economic coercion and economic attraction, a sort of flip side of the same coin. It's not simply about punishing people, but providing an attractive model that other people might seek to emulate or be able to participate in. So I'll provide some historical background there from the United States, and then I'll conclude by looking at the successes or not so much successes of sanctions on Russia and the degree to which where we've been effective at that, and also the degree to which that might have been coming up short, how that fits in to a broader um, policy to try to um, deter or roll back aggression. Now, coercion theory is about influencing the behavior of an adversary, what your enemy is doing. And you can fall into various different categories of what you're attempting to coerce. Sometimes it's compellence that you're trying to take, you know, that you want your target to take an action due to the threat of harm. You want them to do something and you, they want to do it because you're threatening to harm them in some way. Could be airstrikes or a blockade or economic sanctions, being deprived of markets or materiel, all sorts of things that would compel someone to take an affirmative action that um, they would not otherwise want to do. In uh, the case of uh, uh, Russia, for instance, we want to compel them to pull back from Ukraine. Um, that's at the current state. Now, you can also try to deter someone from doing something. They haven't done it yet, but they're about to do it. And we saw this in play prior to the Russian invasion, or, or the upgrading of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. They'd already invaded and occupied it, of course, a decade ago. Um, and in that case, you're trying to get the target to refrain from an action due to the threat of punishment or denial. And we often have thought about this form of deterrence during the Cold War, where we had you know, mutual assured destruction, we have nuclear deterrence, 
We have the Russians engaging in a degree of nuclear deterrence um, where they're operating a conventional war in Ukraine under the cover of their nuclear umbrella. It doesn't deter everything, but it can deter certain, you know, you want to be able to give some latitude so that things don't get out of control. Uh, it, for those of you who have seen the movie Dr. Strangelove, there's a, a line in there where Dr. Strangelove is, explains very succinctly what deterrence is. And he says, you know, deterrence is the art of producing in the mind of the enemy the fear of attack. What are the consequences if I do this thing? And because I fear that, when, you know, it could be nuclear destruction in, in the case of Dr. Strangelove and during the Cold War, that that would deter you from taking action you might otherwise take. And it's a central feature of American foreign policy, and not simply in the nuclear realm, but also in the conventional realm, being able to provide conventional defense provides the threat to an enemy that they'll fail if they attack one of our allies or, or other allies. They would not be successful, and so hence they're deterred, or the costs might be so extravagant um, or exorbitant that they would not engage in that regard. So for those who think you know, that nuclear weapons are obsolete or we don't use them anymore, in this regard, nuclear weapons have been used by the United States every single day since the late 1940s and 50s. They're a deterrent. They're used. There, our ability to be able to use them and to effectively and credibly threaten to use them is a use. It doesn't mean they're blowing up and destroying things, but they're, they're, they have a utility. Their existence provides that, and the threat of it is one that is important. Now, in American history, we've had not always, the United States has not always been a superpower, um, and even before the United States became a country, economic coercion was the method of choice for the American colonists in their dealings with the United Kingdom. Here I have a picture of, uh, um, from the Boston Tea Party of throwing tea in the harbor um, of Boston, but prior to the Tea Act and those activities, the British had put in effect, as those of you probably remember from your American history classes, the Stamp Act it was designed to pay for British military forces to be in the uh, colonies. And the colonists really resented the Stamp Act. They had for it. And all of the colonies started to get together to put an embargo on um, the export to Britain and also a um, and also a boycott of British goods. They thought in their minds, they had a model of how the political system in Britain worked. It's one based on a sort of view of democracy, but of course a fragile one, because Britain wasn't entirely democratic, that you know, the merchants in Britain are pretty important, they're pretty influential, and if we can start harming their economic interests, they will put pressure on the British government to repeal these um, stamp duties on us because they would, you know, if those were repealed, we'd start buying products again, they would make money, everything would flow, and it would be much better. So there's an economic coercion there and a theory of how the world works. So the American colonists started boycotting, and it's not a, you know, uh, it was not a sort of one-sided, hey, this is all we're going to do, and you'll see this in some of the future examples and also in my discussion of Russia, that as, a, as policy or endeavors, these strategies work together with other activities, some of which are more or less violent. There could be information campaigns. Benjamin Franklin was a lobbyist in London for many colonies, and he would get up and speak and otherwise try and influence um, British parliamentarians of the justice of the Americans' cause, that these were you know, good, loyal British subjects, they just wanted representation, they didn't like paying taxes, so on and so forth. So there's an informational aspect going on there. There's also, um, it, you, know, if, you know, if we're honest about it, a sort of, I'll call it extra legal, but it was in fact quite illegal, right? That you know, tar and feathering of customs inspectors, otherwise preventing the uh, activity of merchants dumping products into the harbor. All of these you know, illegal actions that took place also 
put pressure on the governmental authorities. Now in this regard, in the 18th century, when democracy was rather uh, fragile and only within a certain group of people, even in the United Kingdom, there wasn't mass suffrage or mass male suffrage. Very often the way the uh, working classes um, would get their opinions across would be by throwing stones at tomatoes, things at public figures. So there was a degree of, you know, a, a sort of background threat of physical violence that frequently animated the uh, public space. But all of that was working to compel the British government to repeal the Stamp Acts, which in fact they then did. Uh, but the British government but, but the American colonists were not the only ones who could engage in economic coercion. The British government could as well. And they looked around and they, they sort of identified where they thought the most um, you know, troublesome actors were, the most fractious of the colonists in Boston. And um, they passed, among other things, the Boston Port Act, which closed the port of Boston. So if the colonists could put economic pressure onto British merchants, well, the British could put targeted smart sanctions, if you will, onto American merchants in that most truculent of colonies, Massachusetts. Now this created the reactions that we're all quite familiar with from history, but you could see both the British and the Americans were trying to use nonviolent means to pressure and coerce the other side into compliance with their political wishes. And this put a lot of pressure on people. Now, of course, some of the merchants in Boston didn't really like this. You know, people like John Hancock uh, uh, pushed in more and, and made them more radical. So it's a, a tension on how these uh, uh, different methods can play out. I've got another example here where things don't work out quite as had been planned. This, of course, is a famous picture of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. But it was as a result of, if anything, a campaign of financial and economic sanctions by the United States that was too successful. Uh, Japan, at the time, had been engaged in a land war in China, uh, which the U.S had resisted. They also had started to expand their sphere even farther into French Indochina, um, sort of displacing the Vichy government there. And the United States was getting very worried about the Japanese encroachment in the Pacific and particularly in the mainland. So the United States put a series of economic sanctions on the Japanese. They um, uh, um, started licensing and curtailing oil exports which put a great deal of pressure on Japan. But even more importantly, they froze Japan's foreign assets that were in the United States. So even if Japan could find someone who was not the United States or they could get a license to buy oil or other raw materials, they didn't have the money available to do so. So if they could maybe find you know, Venezuela or Peru to sell them, the American banks had all seized Japanese assets. And beyond that, the United States wasn't acting just alone. They were acting in collaboration with the British, who were also very worried about Japanese activity in East Asia. The British, of course, were bogged down in a war in Europe. And the Dutch, who similarly had major colonies in the Far East, um, but their homeland had been occupied, although they continued to fight on. But all of those governments also followed the American lead in isolating uh, Japan. And the American theory, the British and Dutch theory was, well, we're going to deprive Japan of the economic resources to continue to prosecute this war in China. If they relent, pull back, cease their aggression, we can get back to business as usual. And Japan really felt the pinch from this. But how was this received in Tokyo? Well, the Japanese had styled themselves um, in following very much a European style of imperialism. They had seen what had happened in China. In fact, they were very much engaged in it themselves in terms of imperial activity. And to their mind, if they gave in to this British, American, Dutch demand, they would essentially become economic vassals of the United States. They would not be a great power. Their external activity would be subject to the whims 
of the Western imperial powers. They saw how that had played out around much of the world. And they, you know, given the choice of which table they wanted to sit at, was it the great power table where you subjected others to your will and then paged in an imperial fashion? Or was it on the other side where you had to accept the uh, diktats of the major European powers? And for Japan, this was unacceptable to them. They had what were considered relatively few options. They could just continue where they were and suck up the sanctions and eventually their war machine would grind to a halt. They could give in and um, go into a sort of second tier, or third tier status. Or they could try and lance the boil, lash out, seize the raw materials they needed to prosecute the war, maybe get a acceptable peace while the European powers were distracted with the war in Germany, and they could um, continue to pursue what they desired in terms of a continental empire in East Asia. Very risky strategy. They were very well aware of the imbalance of forces against them, but they struck out on that because the alternatives to them were so decisively poor. But it wasn't because the sanctions and the economic measures of coercion were ineffective, it was because they were so dramatically effective and Japan had few other possibilities. So, and in terms of both compellence and deterrence, this policy failed, but not because it wasn't an overwhelmingly powerful um, uh, um, a weapon. So, that brings us to the sort of question of what sort of things can help with sanctions to get you to a, a favorable outcome. Um, now, of course, much of this relies upon the people you're targeting being able to be influenced in a way rather than just lashing out. So having it be part of a broader strategy is a good thing. It's not just, hey, we're having sanctions because we can't think of anything else to do. It needs to be informational elements of communicating what the consequences are, why you're doing uh, things, a diplomatic element to try to bring other people on board, um, uh, perhaps a military element um, that further provides you know, some firming up to deter uh, someone from behaving as the Japanese did. Multilateral works well. If it's just the United States or just Britain or, or just Japan, this tends not to be especially, or just China, just especially effective. You can imagine um, our, or not imagine, you can just look to our sanctions on Cuba that have far outlasted the Soviet Union. In fact, I think now, I mean, it's what, 33 uh, Berlin Wall came down, so the end of the uh, Cold War, and our sanctions on Cuba um, have had, you know, we're up since, well, let's say 1959, although really it's the Kennedy administration, so tops of 30 years of economic isolation during the Cold War, and Cuba has now been isolated as a post-communist country longer than it was isolated as a communist country. And in part of that is because the United States is um, not able, is not the only one, uh, or is the only one largely dealing with the sanctions on Cuba. And you can see this in other areas as well. It also can help to target sensitive sectors in the target country's economy. Obviously oil and um, is a, a very oil and energy and gas are very crucial ones. You see that coming up. Sanctions on Japan is the one I've used, but also one in which we saw during last summer, um, last spring, the concern about Russian sanctions on Europe, the degree to which Russia would curtail European energy supplies, particularly going into a cold winter, which fortunately we, we avoided. But that sort of energy weapon is one that even if a relatively small portion of your trade is one that the rest of the economy is very uh, sensitive to. Um, and it really helps if it's not an especially sensitive sector for you, the person who's doing the threatening. So if um, you're an oil exporter or other products, or it, it might not matter so much to you if you have bigger markets. Because part of sanctions that we often forget is when we sanction someone else, we're also sanctioning ourselves. If we put economic sanctions on 
Iran, and so you can't deal with oil, well, the Iranians are largely blocked from dealing oil with the United States or other countries that go along with those sanctions. But who else is affected? You know, Shell Oil's affected, Mobile's affected, Halliburton's affected. All of these big companies no longer are able to do business with Iran. That hurts them. So they might have other options, which are good for them, but we're sanctioning ourselves. And you can see that this last summer um, because there was, a, there was a flip side, right? Energy prices in the United States rose dramatically, and there were concerns, right, that high energy prices would lead to a drop in support for the Biden administration and the Democrats. They had midterm elections coming up. This might lead to you know, them doing poorly in the polls, and there would strengthen the hand of those who wanted different policies in regards to the Russians, so that you could alleviate this economic pressure of high energy prices, driven in part by the uh, sanctions and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now, oddly also, sanctions tend to work best against your allies. Um, which we often don't think of sanctioning our allies. Um, but our allies very frequently, and by our, I mean, I, I'll mean that in the U.S. sense, but it could be someone else's, the Russians or the Chinese or whatever. Your economies and your societies tend to be relatively more closely linked, and so the effects are clear. And because you have generally favorable political relations, it, the informational aspect of it is rather more meaningful. The United States has frequently engaged in the sort of threat of sanctions um, against many of its uh, allies who had sought at various times or considered exploring nuclear weapons programs. Um, uh, uh, South Korea, the, the uh, uh, Taiwan Republic of China in the 70s, various other countries had at times contemplated developing nuclear programs and the United States was able to suggest to them this would lead to some rather poor uh, consequences. It also tends to work best against democracies because that simple model of politics that I provided you with, with the, before the American Revolution and also during the, um, uh, uh, from last summer's election, sort of posit that the voters will not favor parties that uh, during economic downtimes. You know, as Bill Clinton said, you know, it's the economy stupid, and however the economy got there, that's how voters tend to behave. But that's not necessarily the case in authoritarian countries. They're, they don't rely upon elections to stay in power. Their structure of, of power is rather different, and so therefore they respond or worry about losing an election. And they very often control a great deal of informational resources domestically in the media and so, so forth. And non-democracies can often have a, a tightly controlled government media. And so then it makes it very easy for, say, the Cuban regime to say, hey, look, yeah, we know things are bad. It's not going well. But you know what? It's the Americans' problem. Then we know they're bad actors, right? They used to be here as imperialists. Um, they supported the previous regimes. And they're the ones who are trumpeting that they have sanctions on us. So all these bad things that are happening come from the Americans. So you see this in Putin's Russia, in um, North Korea, and so forth. And of course, there certainly is an element of, of truth to that. The economic sanctions are designed to provide a lack of resources. And there's not much avenue for an alternate point of view to come in. So that more nationalistic approach is one that can, can come in. So those are all features or, or all elements that can have sanctions work. And one way that I would stress is that sort of multilateral sanctions work a great deal. And I've got a chart here for uh, world trade in 2021. And it just gives you an idea that you know, the top um, five trading powers uh, uh, constitute over 50% of world trade. Um, China is the largest, but the Europeans and Americans are not far behind, and um, then there's uh, Japan and South Korea. So among those countries, um, that's a pretty uh, powerful block. And of course, you get other, you know, Mexico, Canada, the United Kingdom, that are also quite um, um, substantial. Now, you'll have heard probably in the last few decades, you know, people talk about BRICS, 
you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and that these developing economies are, are overtaking those of the developed world. And it sort of sounds scary, right? I mean, a brick is a big, hard thing, and they're, they're growing really, really fast. But when you look at this uh, chart here, you realize that bricks are not a Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa story. The bricks are a China story, and if you take, which has its own importance, and Dr. Evans talked about that during the last Great Decisions course, but if you take China out of BRICS, it becomes Brie, which is sort of squishier, softer, not so uh, uh, threatening, and obviously of much less of a, uh, a concern. Not an insignificant one, but um, uh, much less as well. Plus, uh, it should certainly point out that the countries involved have very different political structures. Um, you know, three of them are democracies. Um, some, you know, some of them are middle-income countries. Uh, 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 Russia, of course, is a major nuclear power. Um, so it's not that these are insignificant, but they're more regional powers than others. So that brings me to where we stand and how things have developed with sanctions for Russia. And prior to the invasion, this is the sort of circumstance that was confronting uh, Russia and the West um, as they tried to deter Russia from invading Ukraine. That Russia had certain costs from its previous occupation that it was having to bear and previous sanctions on the Crimea. But also, Russia had a large number of exports, a good share of its exports in raw materials to Western Europe. And Western Europe, as well, was really quite dependent upon Russian imports. So you can see from here, about half of Russian exports go to the European Union. A large portion of that is energy. And to give you a more specific view, here's Russia's major exports on the top, their export partners, and on the bottom, their major import partners. Now keep in mind here, Germany, if you look up there, it's only about 5.8% of its of Russian exports go there, only $19 billion, which is roughly on par with China, not an insignificant amount, but in the bigger scheme of things, not um, so substantial. But Russian imports from Germany are really uh, quite large. It's 12% of German imports, and it's $33 billion. Again, right up there with uh, uh, China at $34 billion. So the Russians are bringing in a whole lot more from Germany than they are sending to Germany. They're sending out oil and gas in large, or they were, oil and gas in large measure, and they're bringing in, um, you know, Mercedes, uh, heavy, you know, um, chemicals, things like that. Um, now, if you flip this over and look at Germany, on the other hand, here's Germany. Where does Russia fit in? Well, it's down there, you know, around the size of Hungary in terms of German export markets. Uh, only about 2% of German exports, because Germany is a huge exporter. It's one of the world's largest exporters. They're, you know, they sort of, you know, I think the Germans get up in the morning and they you know, produce for export and then they, they, they go to the, the pub and, and then they, they, they go home, right? Um, and, uh, and German imports are not especially substantial from Russia either. It's only 1.8% of their imports are coming from Russia. So even with all that energy coming in, it's a pretty small segment for the Germans. So you would think on the some of the characteristics I laid out earlier that, you know, it matters a whole lot more to Russia to be selling to Germany than it matters to Germany to be buying from Russia. But that does, of course, leave aside the sensitivity of the energy markets and then the degree to which Germany and other European countries can redeploy and reorient their trade to compensate for Russian uh, energy losses or, or threats. And of course, they still do import lots of energy from uh, Russia. So this was, over the last year, a bit of a race uh, that the Europeans were engaged in with the Russians, the degree to which the Europeans could delink their energy markets
from the Russians and the degree to which the Russians could reorient their energy markets to the Far East or to the South to sell to clients who were not Europeans and for the Russians could be more reliable. Now, Vladimir Putin and the Russian regime were not um, ignorant of the economic consequences and threats that they could be exposed to by expanding the war in Ukraine. And I've got a chart up here that I'll just walk you through briefly. One of the concerns a country might have is if you have lots of foreign denominated debt, which is to say you've borrowed money in dollars and euros, that exposes you to a great deal of foreign pressure. Now many countries might want to do this because they use that debt to buy things on international markets or engage in, in trade. So you might not want to borrow in rubles because you're buying things from big German or Taiwanese uh, uh, companies and you need to be able to have dollars for those exchanges. Um, on the other hand, um, you have that vulnerability. Well, the Russians have been paying down their dollar-denominated debt over the last 10 years, and euro-denominated debt, and shifting to other assets. Because if you have dollar-denominated debt and you engage in extremely adventurous foreign policies and the US starts turning the screws on you, you become quite uh, vulnerable. But at the same time, they're lowering their dollar-denominated debt with many of the, much of the budget surplus and trade surpluses they have through the big energy sales, they start increasing their international investment position and the amount of assets held by their central bank, so government-owned assets, that if you start to get in trouble and whatever your commercial banks are frozen out of markets, you still have your central bank with a big load of reserves that they might be able to uh, utilize. And the Russians pushed that up by about 250 billion over the five years prior to the invasion. Um, they ended up having reserves of about 600 and something billion just before the invasion. Now, you can see here that when the Russians invaded, there was large scale, albeit not universal, condemnation in the United Nations. A fair amount of abstention in the General Assembly. But you can see here that there's a, you know, a large measure within the many of the security partners of the United States in the Western Hemisphere, in Africa, but a good number of countries that saw themselves as not wanting to get involved. Some of them had a degree of exposure and vulnerability to the Russian energy market and, you know, What's it, you know, what, what would it be to Malawi, for instance, to um, vote against or alienate the Russians? Some energy, there might be some energy market consequences, and that would be much better for them to abstain. But only a small handful, five countries, vote in favor of the Russians, which is to say against the condemnation. So while there's a lot of abstention, the world largely in the General Assembly um, votes to um, um, condemn it. And here are the countries that put the sanctions on Russia. And you can see here again, we often think being quite widespread. And in some ways they are, and in other ways they aren't. You can see huge swathes of the world, even some of the ones in Latin America, for instance in Africa, that voted in favor of the resolution condemning Russia are not honoring the sanctions in the same way the Western countries are. However, the Western countries have the dominant financial and trade economies of the world. They represent, the ones included here represent about 60% of world trade. Um, they represent about 90% of foreign direct investment, about 80% of international foreign reserves. So these are extremely wealthy and powerful countries in an economic sense, even if you can see there are big gaps in terms of the geographic coverage involved. And many of the countries that are not taking part officially have actions by major multinational companies based back in the sanctioning countries that are following these uh, uh, sanctions. So a major Western country, a major Western company operating in Angola or elsewhere might well continue to honor the uh, sanctions of its uh, home country. But the uh, um, but importantly, um, or perhaps disturbingly, the sanctions and the threat of them did not create in the mind of Vladimir Putin and his regime enough of a fear to forestall invading Ukraine. They sort of priced in what they thought the consequences would be. 
and they proceeded anyway. And I think they proceeded in a manner that Western policy make, that was more extravagant than Western policymakers had anticipated. Rather than just continuing the salami tactics of piecing together you know, a land bridge and, and nibbling more at Ukraine, which I think probably most people thought was the likely result, they went for the, the whole shebang, uh, complete regime change in Kiev and occupation of uh, Ukraine. I think that was a uh, uh, you know, remarkably shocking to policymakers in Western Europe and the United States. And the degree of sanctions that were then implemented vastly exceeded what had been threatened before the invasion. I think this was a reaction to the extent of the invasion, and um, the, so the sanctions that came in were much more substantial. And the important one here, this is a sort of list from the time of the invasion from the International Monetary Fund, governments have to you know, provide an accounting of their uh, uh, resources um, in terms of their, uh, their assets. The biggest thing that happened was um, that the vast majority of the securities held were blocked by sanctions. Um, then over 50% of other total currencies, these were often in dollars or euros held by Russian commercial entities um, in Western central banks were blocked as well. They wouldn't let the Russians take them back because they weren't in Russia, they were overseas. Um, then they had um, another 50% of these banks headquartered outside the reporting country, but which reported back. So if you were, um, uh, you know, if you were credit, if, if you were, you know, had a account with, a, a Russian account with Deutsche Bank, but it was based in the Netherlands or something, it was a German bank in another country, that's where those sort of would, would fall. And then there are others the Russians would have difficulty getting at because they're just held internationally for international purposes, like at the, um, uh, at the uh, IMF. Um, and then there's gold that's physically held in, in Russia. Um, I should say, you know, g the gold the Russians held would probably fit into about this half of this room. A, a cube of 20 by 20 by 20 would hold all of the Russians' uh, gold. I'm just to give you an idea. Uh, for those of you who've been over to Bliss Hall at the Air or the Army War College, um, all the gold in the world would fit in Bliss Hall. There's actually not a whole lot of gold in the world um, in in terms of physical space, um, but it's very dense and heavy. So the Russians have hundreds of tons of it, and it's very valuable. Um, and it's physically held in Russia, and it can be used for international uh, transactions. But the big defining element that was extraordinarily remarkable was that the West froze the Russian central bank's assets. So the central bank assets, the assets of a sovereign government that were held abroad, were frozen. And that is an extraordinarily rare thing to do, very unexpected. Um, they did it over a weekend, so the, you know, the Russians couldn't um, uh, move them out. So accounts that were held by a sovereign government abroad were frozen, and that's not usually what goes on. It very rarely happens. The U.S. and several countries are doing the, um, ass the asset, central bank assets of the government of Afghanistan, but it's in part because we don't recognize the Taliban as the, the government. So it's a, really a repudiation in some ways of diplomatic recognition to be doing this, and that was very unexpected. That Vladimir Putin uh, had thought he'd built up a huge war chest and a very large portion of that war chest from the Bank of Russia was frozen in place. And now you see what sort of things are happening, the sort of discussions that are going on that, hey, maybe we can use these uh, assets to pay for the reconstruction of Ukraine, right? Um, you know, I, this sort of is, gets into the, gets into the uh, area of you know, theft, right? Um, that you have your assets abroad and someone else takes them and then they start using them for their purposes and not yours. So you could see how this might start undermining people's uh, confidence and things. But it's extraordinarily effective, and I think also the extent of the universal, near universal condemnation of, of Russia as an international element makes it um, something that there probably won't be as many consequences as there could otherwise be. But it is really a remarkable development to be seizing a central bank's assets abroad. Um, so what were the goals of sanctions on Russia in terms of coercion? Well, the first and the one that failed was deterrence, the, the idea that we would stop Russia 
from acting against uh, Ukraine. They laid out what you know, various sanctions could be, and there certainly were some debates about what areas would be covered. It seemed that it wasn't necessarily the case that Nord Stream 2, for instance, would not become operational. That seemed a bit iffier if the Russians had been more circumspect in their invasion, Nord Stream 2 probably would have gone ahead, although other financial sanctions would, would have come in. But those were unsuccessful, the Russians proceeded. So then what is the purpose of sanctions if they've failed? Well, you know, you can punish someone. You can say, okay, here are the consequences. You will now pay the consequences of, of, of what you, you've done. This is what we threatened, and so we'll, we'll follow through on it, that um, you're, you're now going to suffer harm for having engaged in this behavior. There's also a compellence element that you're gonna suffer harm and we hope this harm, now that we're credibly doing it, um, will compel you to pull back. That you, maybe you didn't believe us. Maybe you thought we wouldn't put these sanctions in. Well, here they are, now it's time to um, pull back. And it seems also that that has not been as uh, successful, although certainly desirable as a policy goal. So what's left? There's a possibility of containment as well and limiting that the, you know, the mask is off the Russian regime. Any thought that we would be uh, having a cooperative relationship with this regime is over with. Even if they withdrew from Ukraine, we know what sort of business they're in. This would provide a respite for them and they'd be back again in Georgia or Moldova or the Baltics, that this is a regime we simply want to contain, deprive them of resources and make their ability to operate much more difficult until we have a regime there that is fundamentally different from the one that behaves the way this one behaves. So it's a denial of resources to Russia that you know you don't trade microchips with them or whatever because they'll put them into sophisticated weapons. It'll make their weapons more useful, so we want to deprive them of that. Now there are ways around this, and you see this with the sort of rolling sanctions. There's the first impetus and now you know, the regular supply chains are disrupted. The Russians are not able to get the microchips or other things they need for the guidance systems on their, you know, higher quality missiles. So they start cannibalizing things. It could be, you know, dishwashers, automobiles, importing, you know, computers from Georgia. There's been a big surge of uh, um, uh, um, imports into Russia from neighboring countries. And they'll cannibalize many of the things they import for parts that could then be used. But if you think about how, say, a Western military supply chain works, you're producing whatever missile you're producing, the microchips show up, you put them in, they're all standard, right? And then you, 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 you build it and you, you pack it off. Well, now, and the Russians would do something similar. Um, well, now imagine that gets disrupted and you're having to come up with different ways to get microchips that are, you know, they'll work, but perhaps not so well. You've got to take them out of a refrigerator or out of a automobiles sensors or out of a, a lab laptop, it makes it a whole lot more difficult to be able to put these pieces together. And while they still might be able to do it, it's much more costly, much less efficient. So, um, the, and, um, and uh, the Russians and have been doing over the last year is trying to stay up to date on this as, as various different entities start importing or, or different avenues, new levels of sanctions come in to try to continue to curtail things. If you have sanctions on one oligarch and then he starts funneling money through his daughter's bank account, well then you sanction the daughter and, and so on and so forth. So you can see that being able to keep up with the intelligence on this can also be important. I've just listed here a variety of uh, sanctions that have been put in across the range on the economy with you know, trade restrictions, on the banking that I discussed, but also you know, denying ships access, limiting the amount they can be insured. You, know, you, can, you can limit a lot of what a ship does if uh, you don't give them insurance to go to certain ports because most operators, you know, if you're going into a war zone and you're worried about getting shot, you might want to have a uh, you know, or your ship sunk, you probably want to have insurance. So that can curtail things um, there. You know, energy, private wealth, travel bans, so forth, the whole gamut of things. But it's not a one-way street. Um, you know, the Russians can do stuff as well. I talked about the cannibalizing parts. They can reorient their energy resources, try and send more to China or other friendlier markets. Uh, what they consider more reliable. Uh, if they're worried about dollars, they can start controlling bank accounts in Russia, 
of foreign companies or individuals. They won't let them take money out. They might force them to convert dollars that they then have to turn over to the Russian government in exchange for rubles at a fixed rate. Um, a variety of things of this uh, uh, nature that they're um, able to uh, engage in. So again, they're not passive recipients of it, and many of our reactions um, need to try and stay ahead of this, um, of you know, how we're going to go about this. Um, here, I talked about just as an example here, um, you can see here in Belarus and Russia, both under sanctions, the amount of uh, trade uh, with the US and the EU has plummeted. But lo and behold, as one might imagine, because they're transshipping, Armenia, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan have seen a surge of imports. All of a sudden, they want to have more products. And where do you think those products might be going? They're pretty much you know, going over, the, uh, going over the, the border. Now, the Russian economy is much larger than these other economies. They're pretty small places. So these surge in imports, even when they're 350%, that's a lot, but it's not making up for the entirety of the losses that the Russians are, um, are, are having. Um, they also have some others, and again, you can see not quite covering the gap. Here's Russia's trade with China, India, and Turkey, which has grown somewhat um, since the uh, war started. But you can see how it's uh, plummeted in terms of its uh, share with uh, the European Union, the UK, the US, and uh, uh, so forth. So there's a gap there that has uh, uh, been pretty dramatic. They've tried to reorient their trade somewhat, but they've not been entirely successful. And at the same time, I discussed you know, how the Europeans were in a race with the Russians, right? They want to reorient their energy supplies. And the Europeans have won this race. The, um, um, uh, and you can see it here, the price of natural gas now is at the level that it was prior to the invasion of, um, of Ukraine. It's a trifle elevated, but it's not the really exorbitant levels that it was before. The Europeans are now getting somewhat more expensive um, gas, liquefied natural gas, getting it from other markets, but they've been able to shift away from their Russian, uh, uh, from their, much of their reliance on Russia. Um, they still get some, but not at the extent they did. And you see a similar dynamic in world oil prices. You had the big surge last summer during the height of, of the, 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 the dislocations from the war, but now we're back down to the level that we were prior to the invasion. And again, it's a rerouting of oil to uh, different, uh, different uh, uh, markets. Um, so the Europeans have run, won this race, and it was, it was predictable that they would because being able to you know, put an ocean-going vessel, re reroute it from the Middle East up to Europe, or bring in liquefied natural gas, you can do those things. But rerouting a pipeline, building a new one, that takes years to do. And then there are still capacity limits. So the Russians were going to have a very difficult time doing that. It's not, they're still doing it. It's not to say that um, they won't be able to move that, move in that delinking direction. But in terms of the immediate term, the Europeans have won that race. See here how the Russians have added to their gold reserves. Um, and um, there's a big uh, spike there, both in terms of the tons of gold they have, which is the left-hand column. They're now up to around 2,200 tons of gold. Um, and on the right-hand side, it says a percentage of their reserves. It's about 20%, one-fifth of their reserves are held in gold um, uh, uh, there. And they're starting to feel the pressure uh, in that regard here. Their budgets, which as they built their war chest prior to the war, they'd been running surpluses, they'd been getting oil and gas uh, revenue to provide a lot of it, um, but we now see that that started to run out. The West has been implementing things like price caps, um, limiting um, the amount that the Russians can get. They've also been uh, limiting purchases somewhat, and the Russians are spending a whole lot of money. They're now up to spending over a third of their budget on security, they're also, in the economic realm, having to subsidize and pay the consequences of disruptions from international markets so life isn't as disruptive for regular, regular citizens. So their budgets, which were um, targeted on pretty high 
oil prices, with the drop of oil prices now are about 20 or $30 a barrel lower than their budget had been counting upon, are starting to feel increasing pressure. And because they can't borrow on international markets, they increasingly have to borrow domestically for um, rubles, which will put them under, you know, there's a limit on how much they can engage in that, especially uh, without inflation, especially as the Russian people have uh, less um, goods to buy, goods to purchase. So as the economy gets squeezed, they also will be getting a squeeze from their, their, uh, their government. So this puts a, a degree of, of pressure there. Again, one of the problems that emerges, of course, is, you know, especially with authoritarian governments, it doesn't mean that they just turn on a, a, a pin and say, okay, well, that's it. They have very big objectives. Um, they're pretty crucial now, I think, to the survival of the regime, and it makes it so that, uh, you know, it's still a bit of a quandary. But you can see that we can make life very difficult for people, and there is a deterrent value of what's happening to Russia for other countries. It's not a good thing what's going on, but if anyone else were to want to engage in this sort of activity, they can see what the consequences are, and there's a great deal of credibility to it in terms of the uh, Western response. So a lot of other countries that might want to um, think about rearranging international borders violently will have to start thinking whether these are consequences they might want to uh, 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 suffer from. And Russia's, you know, it's a, it's a big country, a great power, if you will, or at least a great regional power. So there's a, uh, um, you know, as someone once said, there's a lot of ruin in a country. Um, and um, so countries can put up with a lot, but um, I think it does make it so that their objectives are very difficult to achieve, um, and we've been making them increasingly so. So with the, on that note, I will uh, conclude and turn things over, Michael, for questions. I, will you be the moderator for those?